with the wonder of our precious Savior. Thank you, Pastor. If you turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that's where we're going to turn tonight. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to preach. Um, back home, I'm the music man. I work, I play the piano, and I work with the special music, the, uh, the children's choir, the adult choir, and uh, very other, various other musical capacities. And I enjoy doing that, but I know beyond a shadow of doubt that preaching is what the Lord's called me to do. And right now, I'm just, like I said, I'm working with the music, and I'm just getting some practical ministry training there at my home church, waiting for God to show me that next step where he wants me to go. And I'm thankful for every opportunity that I do get to preach, whether at my home church or here in Austin, Texas, where my mom goes. I'm so thankful that the pastor is willing to step out of his pulpit every once in a while and allow somebody like me to come in and preach, somebody who he barely knows. He's only, he's only met me a few times. But I'm so thankful that, that he trusts me and he allows me to do this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 17 is where we'll begin reading. We'll read through the end of the chapter. The scriptures say, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did, as though, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's, stead, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you once again, Lord, for another opportunity to proclaim your word. Lord, I pray that you'd be with me tonight. Lord, help me to keep my thoughts straight, Lord, and that I'd be able to follow my notes and really just convey this message, Lord, that you've given me, that we'd, we'd take it to heart, Lord, that we'd understand it, Lord, and that we would uh, leave here changed because of it, Lord, that we leave here with a greater desire to serve you, Lord, and a, a greater desire to see souls saved, Lord, and brought to you. Lord, I want to thank you for all you've done, Lord, and everything you will do in our lives. In your blessed holy name, I want to pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is a very familiar verse. Um, most people in here could probably quote the verse. It's one that we know by heart. It's one that's quoted all the time because we, we understand that as Christians, we're new creatures. The Bible says, old things have passed away, all things have become new. And a lot of times, when we read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that's where we want to go. That's where we want to... We, we almost gloss over the first part of the verse. And the first part of the verse uses a very specific phrase that is it's quite profound when you think about it, and it has a lot of implications. The Bible says in, in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. This phrase in Christ, like I say, a lot of times we may gloss over it and move past it to get to what we would call the meat of the portion, which would be the fact that we're no longer that old man, we're new. But you know that's conditional. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We understand from Scripture that there are basically three categories that we fall into as human beings on this planet. Every man, past, present, and future, will fall into one of these three categories at some point in their life. The first of which is the one into which we all have fallen, thanks to great, 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 granddaddy Adam. We are without Christ. Man in his natural state is without Christ. The second state is that of which Paul speaks here, and that is the state of being in Christ, which leads us to the third state, and pretty much the most exciting, if you ask me. The third state is, the mo is, is that state of being with Christ. And at, as we pass from this life to the next, we will pass from being in Christ to being eternally with Christ, Amen. which is incredibly exciting. We all have family members over there. My father left us six years ago to go be with Christ. And though I miss him here, he's much more happier with Christ than he ever was here on earth. Uh, man, I said it, man in his natural state is without Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 2. If you turn there, real quickly, we're just going to read a, one verse. Ephesians chapter 2, it's one of my favorite chapters, and it's one that speaks heavily of the fact that without Christ, there is no hope. Verse number 12, Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says that at that time, you were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. 
Without Christ, we have no hope. Amen. Charles Spurgeon put it this way when describing the, the three different states. He says, he said, the man without Christ is without hope. He said, without Christ, this is where we were all born and nurtured. And even though we hear the gospel and the Bible be in our houses, and even though we use a form of prayer, yet until we are born again, we are without God, without Christ, and without strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. He said, a man may stand at the banqueting table and may be without food, unless he puts out his hand to grasp that which was provided. And a man may have Christ preached in his hearing every Sabbath day and be without Christ, unless he putteth forth the hand of faith to lay hold upon him. It is a most unhappy condition to be, to be without Christ. It is inconvenient to be without gold. It is miserable to be without health. It is deplorable to be without a friend. It is wretched to be without reputation. But to be without Christ is the worst lack in all the world. Oh, that God would make all of us sensible of it, who are now the subjects of it, and may we no longer tarry in the position of being without Christ. Man in his natural state is without Christ, and man without Christ is without hope. But praise the Lord, we don't have to stay that way. Praise God. Uh, salvation is a free gift, and tonight we all stand at that banqueting table, as Charles Spurgeon would put it. We all stand, we have Christ preached to us tonight. And all you have to do is reach out and take it. It's a free gift. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And verse 24 and following, Being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Ephesians chapter 2, if we were to read the first ten verses, like I said before, Ephesians chapter 2 is probably my favorite chapter in the Bible. It's, it's, it's rich and it's full of, it's just a reminder to us that, of where we come from and where we're going. I'm going to and, I'm gonna go ahead and read the first ten verses because they're powerful. I can't paraphrase them any better than Paul has written them. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And then verse 4 comes in, and this is, this is quite possibly my favorite verse in this whole chapter. It says, But God... But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Amen. <laughs> and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And then verses, verses 8 and 9, very familiar to us. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Man in his natural state is without, without Christ, but we don't have to say that way. And the believer, through faith in Jesus Christ, no longer lives his life without Christ. He lives his life in Christ. And when you think about it, to live your life in Christ is quite an extraordinary thought and concept. What does it necessarily mean to be in Christ? What does it mean for the believer, the fact that we're in Christ? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says that we're called to God's purpose and given God's grace before the world began. It says in verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And, and verse 8, be not, therefore, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
In Christ, we are called to God's purpose and given God's grace even before the world began. In Christ, we're securely bound by a love to God. By, by, we, we are securely bound by, a, by love to a God who cannot and will not fail. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 says this. What shall we say then? What, what, shall, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. <laughs> verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord. In Christ we are securely bound by love to a God who cannot and will not fail. In Christ we have redemption. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We've already read Romans chapter 3, but I'll read verse 24 and 25 again because I have it here in my notes. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the redemption that, that is where? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. In Christ, not only do we have redemption and forgiveness, we're justified. And his righteousness is imputed to our account. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Christ, we're being sanctified, and we're being made holy daily. 1 Corinthians 1.2 says, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, which with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. In Christ we have everything that we could possibly need. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your needs, according to his riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. Uh, in Philippians 4 we also learn that in Christ we have peace that passes all understanding. Philippians 4.7, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. And here's one that we've already read about, but I saved it for last because it helps me transition into my next point. In Christ we have eternal life. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We understand that in Christ, not only do we have eternal life, but according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we've been given new life. Amen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we understand that a new life requires a new lifestyle. That that would, that to me, that just seems to follow suit. So how should being in Christ affect the way we live? According to Ephesians chapter 4, there's a putting off of certain things. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'll go ahead and turn there. I didn't bring any bookmarks, so I'm trying to move my papers around and make sure I don't lose my spot in my text. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Paul writes, And that you put on the new man, which after God... Wait, I, I skipped ahead. Excuse me. Thank you, notes. for Chapter verse 17 is where we want to begin. Chapter 4, verse 17, Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lusts. In verse 23 it says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, 
we continue into verse 24, we understand that simply putting off an old lifestyle does not constitute a new lifestyle. When we put off an old lifestyle, we have to put on a new lifestyle. When you take off your old shoes, you've got to put on your new shoes. Take off the old socks, you've got to put on the new socks. Verse 24 continues. Paul says, don't, don't just not do stuff. You've got to do certain things. In verse 24, he says, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It says in verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. As we put off lying, we put on truth. Verse 26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. We're to be angry and we're to sin not. You might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can I be angry and sin not if I'm not supposed to be angry? It says, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I've written here that there is such a thing as righteous indignation. And there will be times in our own lives, as Jonah, as Jonah would say, that we do well to be angry. The problem arises when we brood over those situations, because brooding turns to bitterness, and that gives a stronghold, that gives the devil a strong foothold in our lives. When he says, be angry and sin not, I can be angry and sin not. Like I said, there are certain times when you can be angry. There are certain, it's, it's okay to be mad at the devil. It's okay to get upset about, the th about ISIS, about the things that are going on in the Middle East. It's okay to get upset about those things, because those are things that we ought to get upset about. But the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't let it get a foothold in your life. When you get angry about something, don't let it completely control you, because that turns to bitterness. And when you're bitter, you can't, you can't, a, a bitter root cannot produce good fruit. When you're bitter, you're paralyzed, and you can't do anything for the Lord when you're bitter about something. The Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Verse 28, he says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. As we put off stealing, we're to put on a good work ethic. Verse 29, this is one that a lot of times we kind of just kind of push past and don't worry about. The Bible says, Let no communi com corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We're supposed to put off corrupt communication, and we're supposed to put on that communication that would edify. Verse, 21, verse 31, Paul gives us a little list here. He says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And to replace that, he says, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. The question arises to me, why, why would I want to, why do I necessarily need to put off this, new, this old life and put on a new life? Why do I need a new lifestyle? The reason why we need a new lifestyle is because we were created for a very specific purpose. This new creature spoken of in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, was created for a very specific purpose. Now, earlier, I brought in this box that has stuff in it. And Brother Josh pointed out Advocare. I don't even know what Advocare is, but it's a box that my mom had. And in it, I've brought some things to illustrate created for a specific purpose. Here I have a bottle of water which actually works out well because I'm a little thirsty right now. Thankfully, this bottle of water does exactly what it's supposed to do. Can anybody tell me what a bottle of water is designed to do? It's designed to hold and dispense water. And that's exactly what this bottle of water has done for me right now. I also have with me this. Can anybody tell me what this is? A plane, exactly. It's a wood plane. And it has a blade on the bottom. I've moved the blade so I don't accidentally scratch the pulpit. But uh, it has a blade on the bottom, and it's meant to where perhaps I was, you know, if I was a carpenter, which I like to do woodwork, but I wouldn't consider myself a carpenter, I, and I had two pieces of wood that maybe didn't quite match up, I had glued together, and I wanted them to match up perfectly and be smooth, I would take this plane, and I would slide it across that piece of wood, and it would shave off all the shavings that aren't even. Shh. Shh until it's even and smooth. And that's exactly what this plane was designed to do. And the, I bought it for four dollars the other day at a thrift store. And it's actually in pretty good condition. The only problem is the blade's dull. And with a dull blade, it won't, it won't exactly do what it was designed to do. But it makes a good paperweight. 
It's pretty heavy. It'll sit there. I can I can sharpen the blade and it'll work out perfectly for me. I mean, it's a multi-purpose item. You know, although it's designed to do one thing, I can do more than one thing with it. Hey, look at there. I have an iPhone in my pocket. This iPhone, most, a lot of most of us have smartphones today. I didn't get a smartphone until a couple of years ago, but I fell in love with it. It does all kinds of stuff. With my smartphone, I can take pictures, I can send pictures, I can receive pictures, I can post things to Facebook, I can look up anything I want to look up on the internet. A guy once asked me, he said, well, I, I asked a guy, a guy a question, he said, I don't really know. And he pulled out his phone, he said, I don't, I don't even know why I think anymore. Why do I even need to think? I've got an iPhone. I, can, I don't need to know anything because it's all right here in this little bitty box. Another thing this thing can do, the other day I was working, um, I was putting up a fence and uh, one of the guys went to get some supplies and when he left, he left with my level. And we're doing work for a company, uh, a management company, and they want all their fences to look perfect, all their lines to be just right. And I realized that I can download a level app on my phone. That's pretty cool. This phone can do just about anything. It's even got an app that's called the Ocarina app, which I don't know if anybody's familiar with that app, but an Ocarina is... It's a wind instrument, much like a, a whistle of sorts. It's got little holes on it. And it's kind of funny shaped, and you can play music as you blow into it. With the Ocarina app, I can blow into the microphone and play music. That's pretty cool. And then if I want to step back in the Stone Age, I can actually make a phone call with my iPhone. Huh, who'd have thunk? It's a multi-purpose item. But we do have items that were designed for one purpose. I have a pen. This was designed for one purpose, and that is to write. If the pen doesn't write, I throw it away. I've thrown away hundreds of pens because they don't write. But if I have a pen that writes, I like to keep it. I have in my possession a camera, a 35 millimeter camera. It's about 35 years old, but it takes magnificent photos because that's what it was designed to do. It takes better photos than my iPhone because that's what it was designed to do. And the last item that I brought with me is this. This, this little item is listed on the 100 gadgets that have changed the world. I don't know if you, it's, I know it's a long ways away and some of you might, might not be able to see it. It's exactly what it is. It's a double-edged safety razor. And believe it or not, this little item right here, when it was invented in 1904, changed the face of the presidency forever. Since then, we've only had one president in our entire history, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, since 1904 that had any sort of facial hair because with the invention of the double-edged safety razor it became possible and more convenient for men to shave every day of their lives and so our presidents have all been clean saving since this this little dealie right here changed the face of the presidency forever and that was because it was designed for one very specific purpose and it was used for that very specific purpose, and that would be to shave the face. This plane, when used for its purpose, it does great things. This camera, when used for what it was designed to do, takes wonderful pictures. This bottle, when it works, when it does what it's supposed to do, is a blessing to me, because it holds water and dispenses it into my mouth when I'm thirsty. This new creature that we are, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, was created for a very specific purpose. If you turn back to, to, back to our text in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. I believe wholeheartedly through my study of the scriptures that this new creature that I am was created with a specific purpose. And I believe that, that purpose is outlined here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. It says, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You might say, well, what does reconciliation mean? Well, I looked it up in my Webster's 1828 dictionary. Reconciliation can be defined as the act of reconciling, or the state of being reconciled, reconcilement, 
restoration to harmony, renewal of friendship, recon and he, this note was in the Webster's 1828 dictionary. You won't find it in the dictionary today, but in 1828, Webster put this in because it's important. He said, reconciliation and friendship with God really form the basis of all rational and true enjoyment. To reconcile is to cause to be friendly again, to conciliate anew, to restore to friendship, to bring back to harmony, to cause to be no longer at variance, as to reconcile persons who have quarreled. We find it evident in the definition that reconciliation is a bipartisan agreement between two parties that are at enmity. Two parties that disagree, that fight over something. In order to reconcile, both parties must be reconciled. And Paul says, in Christ, God hath reconciled himself to us, but it's up to us to reconcile him. God has already taken care of everything that stands between us and him. He's already sent his son to die on the cross, to pay for our sins. He rose again, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And, he, and all we have to do to, to, to gain eternal life, to gain reconciliation to God, is accept it. To turn back to him, and to, as, as, um, as Spurgeon would say, you know, as we stand at the banquet table, to reach out and take that which has been freely offered. And this new creature, praise the Lord, I have been reconciled to God through his son. And when I was seven years old, I trusted Christ as my savior. And since then, the two of us have been reconciled. There have been times when I've seen things differently, when I've tried to go my own way and do things. But since then, we've been reconciled. And Paul says that now it's my duty as one who is in Christ, a new creature Christ, as, as he would put in Ephesians chapter 2, unto good works. In Ephesians chapter 2, created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I've been created with a very specific purpose in mind. When God created me anew, he created me to reconcile man to God. He created me to go out and reach others for Christ. And I know that's what I spoke on this morning in Sunday school, but I feel it's important. It's in the scriptures more than one time that we as Christians, are not meant to sit idly by. We're not meant not to work. In, in Genesis chapter 2, we find that from the very beginning, man was created to work. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to sit around and do nothing. To eat the fruit. No, that's not what it says. To dress it and to keep it. Amen. God didn't create Adam to simply enjoy the fruit of the garden. God was placed, Adam was placed in the garden by God to dress it and to keep it. And though some would argue that, you know, work is a curse. Work is a curse. I hate the fact that we have to work. Work is actually a blessing. And to tell you the truth, over the, over the few years that I've been alive, I mean, as a teenager, I would have sat down and said, man, I hate working. Working, so I just want to play video games. I don't watch TV. I'm going to sit around and do nothing. Yeah, I'd rather do nothing than work. But nowadays, I mean, if I'm not working, I'm bored out of my mind. I can't stand not working. I've got to be at work. I've got to be busy doing something. Work is a blessing from God. Amen. Work is something that we were designed to do. And Solomon came to that conclusion in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, when he said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of man. Work was a gift from God, and that was man's first duty, was work. To dress the garden and to keep it. Our duty today, as outlined in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and as given in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 26, is that we would go, therefore, to all nations and preach the gospel. That we would reach everybody that we can for Christ. This new creature that was created, this new creature in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 was created with a specific purpose in mind, and that was to go out and win others for Christ. To reconcile man to God. Just as my safety razor was designed to shave my face, this plane was designed to cut wood, this camera was designed to take pictures, this watch was designed to tell time. People say, well, I got a watch, I got a, I got a phone, I don't need a watch. Well, this, this watch was designed to tell time, and it's very accurate in telling time. It's actually atomic, and it always tells me the right time, even when my phone is dead. It runs on light, so it never runs out of power. It, I love my watch. It's on my wrist every day of my life, except when I'm working, because when I work, I get careless and things break. But I love my watch, because it does exactly what it was designed to do. I have with me, I actually had another thing in my box. I was kidding you when I told you that was my last thing. I have another watch. This watch I bought in Canada. 
And I don't wear this watch. One thing, I'm not really a big fan. I bought it just because I was in Canada and I was looking for something affordable that I could buy and have a souvenir from Canada. And so I bought this watch. It looked kind of cool, but I've never worn it. And I probably never will. And the reason for that, the reason that is, is because it doesn't tell time. This one, <laughs> yeah. You look at me like, well, it doesn't tell time. It's a watch. It was designed to tell time. Well, the reason is the battery's dead. And, it does, and I don't really feel like going out and get a new battery. But let's, for sake of illustration, let's say this watch is just plain broken. It doesn't tell time. And because this watch doesn't tell time, I don't put it on my wrist. Because this watch doesn't do what it was designed to do, I don't use it. If this bottle of water decided that it wanted to leak water all over this platform, it would be out of this auditorium very quickly, I assure you. Because it doesn't do what it was designed to do. At home, I have another camera that I bought on eBay for $6 because I thought it was a good deal. And then as soon as I hit the buy it now button, of course, once you hit the buy it now button, you've bought it now, I looked and it said, for parts, not working. <laughs> oh man, great. Yeah, I got a camera that doesn't work. And I've never once used that camera to take a picture because it doesn't do what it was designed to do. It's good for nothing, but maybe a paperweight. This watch is good for nothing, but sitting on a shelf and looking good because it doesn't do what it was designed to do. So I ask you the question, I mean, if, if I'm not going to wear my watch, if I'm just going to throw it away because it doesn't do me any good, if I'm not going to use the camera because it's busted, I mean, what good is a broken camera, really? What good is a broken watch? What good is a water bottle with holes in it? That brings me to the question, what good is a Christian who doesn't win souls? What good is a Christian who comes every week and sits in the pews, who participates in every service, who sings out as loud as they can to the Lord, but isn't active in soul winning, isn't active in reaching others for Christ. What good is a Christian who doesn't win souls? If a, if a, if a Christian has been designed to reconcile man to God, and he doesn't reconcile man to God, what good is he? Uh, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus put it very bluntly. He said in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 5, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 13, he said, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the, salt, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of man. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. The message tonight is, is I don't want to sound like I'm condemning you for not going out and winning, winning souls, because for all I know, all of you are active in winning souls. I want to encourage you with the fact that as you go out, if you remember that's what you've been designed to do, it'll make things a lot easier for you. If I remember that, that I don't shave my face with this, because that's not what this was designed to do. I shave my face with this because that's exactly what this thing was designed to do, and it does a great job at it. I don't take pictures with my water bottle because that's not what my water bottle was designed to do. I take pictures with my camera because my camera was designed to take pictures. As we go out and we try to win souls for Christ, remember that the believer in Christ is a new creature, created and designed for the express purpose of reconciling man to God. And I just want to, once again, I just, I'll just i leave you with the question, what good, what good is a Christian who doesn't win souls? If you want to do good, if you want to be used of God, if you want to please God, as, as I, many of you weren't in Sunday school this morning, but I preached at a Haggai chapter 1, and I talked about building the house of the Lord, and how that was God's purpose for Israel, despite all opposition, despite the decree from the government that said, don't you be building, you guys stop your building, it was God's purpose for Israel that they would build the house. God's purpose for you, God's purpose for me, what he's designed me to do, what he's designed you to do, is go out and win souls, to bring them in, to bring others to a saving knowledge of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Like I said, tonight, we, most of us in here, I would trust, have, taken, have partaken of that great banquet table that Charles Spurgeon talked about, the free gift of salvation. And w would it not be foolish of us to, to just sit there and gorge ourselves at the table and not invite others to come? All this is laid out freely for us, what we neglect to tell others. What good is a Christian who doesn't win souls for Christ? What good is a camera that doesn't take pictures? What good is a plan that doesn't plan? What good is a razor that doesn't shave? What good is a Christian who doesn't win souls for Christ? I encourage you tonight, take some tracks with you as you leave. 
in, in, endeavor this week to go out and talk to somebody. We all work with people. I mean, some, some are retired and some don't work. But those of us who work, we work with people. And those people are souls. And I, I dare say, unless you work at a church, or unless you work in a, in a, in a Christian school or an organization that's very faith-based, odds are not everybody that you work with is saved. Not everybody that you work with has that opportunity to hear the gospel. And I encourage you this week, invite somebody to church. Invite somebody to the New Year's Eve service on Thursday. Amen. Try, try to get people into the, into the house of God. Work at the ministry of reconciliation which has been given unto us. As you go to the store, you're going to meet clerks. You're going to you go through the drive-thru. You're going to meet people at the drive-thru. Give them a tract. It's, it's easy. It may feel awkward at first, but after you've given out a hundred or so, it just becomes second nature. Just, ah, here's a tract, here's a tract, here's a tract. Everybody take a tract. That, it may seem small, like a small effort, but that seed's been planted. You give them that tract, they read that, the gospel's in that little tract, that little piece of information. So I encourage you this week, just go out and try to win souls. I encourage you this year, as you start the year 2016, look back on 2015 and think of how many souls you won last year. And if it's none, you got some work to do. Because it's what you're designed to do. It's what, you, it's, it's what God has called each and every one of us to do, is win souls. So in 2016, endeavor that you're going to win souls. That you're going to bring people to Christ. Because it's what you've been designed to do, and it's what you ought to do. Preacher? Let us please our heads bowed, eyes closed. We're going to be singing number 156.